thank you for, for coming out, making some time to talk. So let me turn my screen sharing on and let's get started. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the maritime history of two of our local rivers, which has been an interest of mine for many years and that I was fortunate to publish a book about a few years ago. So most of us, I think, are going to be familiar with the geography of our region and some of the road networks and the river networks. But let's just take a moment and quickly review some, some uh, facts about our local geography. If you think about the port of New York, New York Harbor, Hudson River, Long Island Sound, Raritan Bay, Newark Bay, it's really one of the world's great seaports. It's one of the uh, largest estuary systems of any of the uh, world's uh, major cities. It is a region that was designed or a region that could naturally give birth to a very rich maritime heritage. So if you think about it, we have Manhattan Island, which was, is, was and is the center of New York City and the center of the country's uh, commerce. Around the Bergen Peninsula, we have Newark Bay, and we have the Passaic River reaching as far north and west as modern day Passaic. I was navigable, or I should say it was tidal up to present day uh, Garfield, which means that all along the Passaic River and a little past it, it was suitable for maritime trade. Hackensack River is the same thing, starting again at Newark Bay and reaching north almost to what is today the Oradale Reservoir. This entire Hackensack Valley was again accessible by, uh, by uh, ship. The head of tide of the Hackensack River is in Newbridge, north of Hackensack. So this entire area was suitable for seaborne trade with the larger world. So I want to begin by talking about the time before we had a railroad network, before we had a really good road network, and give you the, uh, begin with the idea of a hub and a spoke. The hub was the commercial center of New Amsterdam and then New York, and the spokes are all of these rivers the Passaic River, the Hackensack River, the Raritan River, the Hudson River, up into Long Island Sound. When you didn't have a road network, you didn't have the railroads, that the only way you could get into northern New Jersey was by ship or by boat. So let's talk about how that worked and how the trade developed along these hub and spokes. And here is a picture or, or engraving of New York City when it was New Amsterdam in the 1660s. This was the major seaport. This was the commercial center. Now, on the one hand, we had a very nice way to reach into the hinterland to trade, to collect goods, to uh, bring people and um, in and out of the hinterland. But on the other hand, not only have we been diffusing trade, but we have also been diffusing capital. So that meant that all of the places where people came to the rivers to trade, to uh, get on boats, they became um little independent if you will almost miniature seaport but that was diffusing capital and so none of new jersey's 
None of New Jersey's small seaports ever became a large seaport. The trade and the money was always being sucked towards New York City and to Philadelphia. Newark, of course, became a seaport in the coastal trade. Perth Amboy became a seaport in the coastal trade. Boarding Town became a seaport in the coastal trade. But as far as major seaports, because of this hub and spoke model, and because of the fusion of capital, everything began, everything really was centered in New York City. Now, where the roads met the rivers were what we call the landings. And these were where ships would come and they would land their cargoes or land the people. So let's, before we talk about this economic model and the importance of the landing, let's, talk, let's imagine we're standing on the riverbank. We're looking at the, uh, over the Hackensack or the Passaic River. What kind of boat would we have seen on these rivers at, at, this, at this time period? Again, before there was a really good road network. One of the most common boat types we would have seen is the sloop, a single mast for an aft rig with a gas fail. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. This was the smallest commercial trading vessel that was practical to operate on the Hackensack and to say River. This boat type was introduced to the New York region by the Dutch when it was still New Amsterdam. And the sloop was extensively used on the Hudson River. And some of you may be familiar with the Hudson River sloop Clearwater, the replica sloop designed or replica sloop uh, built under the uh, guidance of Pete Seeger, the famous folk singer, or, and um, some of you may have seen or been aboard the Clearwater on the Hudson River. But again, the sloop here is typically the smallest commercial vessel that you would have seen on the river. A slightly larger version of the sloop that had a top sail, which is shown right here, would have been more common in the coastal trade. The sloop again has a single mast that has the, um, the, the sail, the fore and aft sail that reach from the forward to the after part of the vessel. But this larger top sail would have made travel to the West Indies or farther along the coast more practical. So if you were going, say, from Newark, New Jersey to Barbados or Jamaica or someplace warm, you would have traveled aboard a sloop like this. A slightly larger vessel with two masts is the schooner. And this is about the largest type of vessel we would see on the Pacific and Hackensack River. This is a rather small schooner. Uh, the type is called the pinky, presumably because it is rather small. But this is a typical sort of colonial era schooner that would have been used to trade on the Passaic and Hackensack River. Now here in the greater New York region, we had a unique boat type called the Periaga. The Periaga is a some is a unique vessel that was uh, very common in the greater New York area on the Hudson, Route, Pacific, and Hackensack Rivers. This was not a seagoing vessel. It was a flat bottom, short haul cargo vessel with two uh, sails, a leeboard instead of a deep keel, and no head sails. It's sort of a sailing, type of a sailing barge, although some of them had holes that looked like giant canoes. If, they, if you were on the bank of the Hackensack or Passaic River looking at a trading vessel, it's very possible you would have seen one like this. They pretty much disappeared by the end, by the uh, Civil War, and no, uh, no known vessels of this type have survived. So let's talk about the idea of the landing, the miniature seaport where the roads uh, met the rivers. What could you buy 
at the landing. Basically, this is where you got your manufactured goods. This is where you got your tools. This is where you got your books, your umbrellas, your cloth. And this is where you sent out your farm products, such as hay, grain, corn, watermelons, cantaloupe, cabbages, firewood, whatever. Usually there was a store at the landing, but the landing was not just a place to buy and sell things. It was also the center of the community. We'll talk about that in a moment. On the Hackensack River, the northernmost landing was at New Milford at Buskirk's Mill. Buskirk uh, had, a, had a mill at the head of Tide for grinding uh, wheat, and he would send flour to the markets of New York City aboard the two schooners, the Kate Lawrence and the General Grant. This is a late 1800 photograph showing one of those schooners at the toward the end of commercial navigation. Hackensack was also a site of a was also a seaport where trading schooners again would take agricultural produce, firewood, hay, out of Bergen County to the New York market and bring back commercial uh, manufactured goods, cloth, exotic foods like oranges and lemons, brandy, um, alcohol, and anything that wasn't produced locally. And this is New Bridge Landing, just north of Hackensack. Now, this is not a painting of what it looked like during the colonial era, but it is a modern um, artist ideal, artist reconstruction of the what is today the Susan House Museum of the Burton County Historical Society, a small trading sloop, the new bridge across the Hackensack River, which dates to the 1760s, and some of the outbuildings. This is again is a very important trading point where the manufactured goods were brought in and the agricultural products of Bergen County and even some of the iron from Southern New York and the area around Ringwood were brought down and shipped out. And this is a photograph from a, uh, by, taken by a, uh, I think a canoeist uh, showing the new bridge landing as it appears today. Again, Soybean House, the Cuban House Museum, the actual new bridge. This is the 1915 era bridge, but the Hackensack River is still there and it is still navigable by small boats. Turning our attention over to the Passaic River, this is a quick point Wananak, and if you know how to pronounce it, uh, God bless you. But this was the landing for most of that served the farms in Wayne. We have records of the local farmers in Wayne Township. The miller who operated the mill across the street from where the library is today, sending their agricultural products to this landing for transshipment to New York City. Not only was this landing a place to buy and sell, but it was also where the post office was, and it was also a place where people could get together. There are, uh, there are reports of the young people coming to the landing, and after the work was done for the day, selling their goods or, and loading and unloading their wagons, they would have a dance on a Saturday evening. It was a place to get your mail, it was a place to meet people, it was a place to buy and sell. And this is a painting of uh, Pesach, the Quake Quantanach Landing, around the eight, early 1850s. You can see we have a, 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 a drawbridge here, and we have uh, one of our trading sloops and a small schooner here at the landing. Now, one of the great things about the Hackensack and Passaic Rivers is that it enabled manufactured goods, to, imported goods to come in 
to the region. It enabled the agricultural photos and the firewood and the iron and the hay to get out of the region. But when the American Revolution came, it also enabled the British to get into this region. So let me just think about this for a minute. The main British base of operations in the northern colonies was the city of New York, or was on Manhattan Island. The British had control over the magnificent New York Harbor. They had an immense navy. Uh, it made a wonderful base of operations, but they were at the wrong end of a transatlantic supply chain. So what are you going to do about that? Well, you have just across the Hudson River, you have an extremely rich, extremely fertile farmland. And so you send a boat over into the Hackensack River, you send a boat up into the Passaic River, and you help yourself to cattle and sheep and uh, firewood or whatever else you needed to feed, uh, feed your troops. Incidentally, this photograph from a recent reenactment shows the uh, uniform of the uh, loyalists who fought in Bergen County. So if you were defending your landing or defending uh, the faith or hacking back from the British Army, this is what you would have seen, or this would be uh, the types of uh, troops you would have encountered. New Bridge Landing is perhaps the first and most important landing in terms of what happened there during the American Revolution. During the summer and fall of 1776, the American army tried to occupy New York City, and there was a large base of operations, a large military base in Washington Heights directly across the river from Fort Lee. Of course, we all know George Washington, after whom Washington High School is named, but Fort, uh, Fort Lee was named after American General Lee. Now, as the British rolled up Manhattan Island in the fall of 1780, the American army had to retreat across the Bergen Peninsula they retreated across the Hackensack River at Newbridge, and then they retreated across the Passaic River at uh, what is now Passaic. Uh, they marched to what is today Wallington and crossed the Passaic River at what is today Passaic, and then eventually crossed the state of New Jersey all the way to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. But one of the most, this is a model, a photograph of a model uh, showing the American retreat over the new bridge, over the Hackensack River. And a man named Thomas Paine was sitting on the riverbank during the retreat. It was November, it was cold, it was snowing, the weather was atrocious. And he was inspired to write that these are the times that try men's souls, the summer soldier and the Sunshine Patriots. Uh, New Bridge Landing still of course commemorate this event. We call New Bridge Landing the bridge that saved a country. And uh, if the American troops had not crossed this bridge ahead of the Royal Navy that was coming up river and the British Army that was chasing them in the rear, uh, we would our country's history would certainly have been very different. This uh, map, it comes from the Library of Congress and it shows the location of the British posts that were established to control the Hackensack and the State River. There was a post at Newbridge Landing, where we just saw. There was a post at Hackensack. There was a post at what is today the State. There was a post in uh, what is today Newark and Elizabethtown. So these enabled the British to control the rivers. These enabled the British to use the rivers to bring troops into this region, to forage for supplies, to raise the farms, to carry off the cattle, the sheep, and the other supplies that the British needed 
to feed their army in New York City. The British eventually did catch up to the Americans at the new bridge. The Royal Navy did send some small gunboats up the river, and the British were able to establish a camp at New Bridge. This is, of course, a modern reenactors uh, recreating that camp at New Bridge. There are, of course, a number of things that are different in this photograph. Uh, obviously, the civilian visitors to the camp were not wearing shorts, and the weather was far more miserable. The trees would have been bare. It was November and December. But again, it gives you an idea of what you were seeing had you gone to New Bridge during the time it was occupied by the British Army and the Loyalist militias. The British did have several uh, row galleys and gunboats that patrol these rivers regularly. Whether you were foraging for supplies, you were, there was a number of reasons you would want to patrol these rivers. We talked a lot about foraging for supplies, but there are other re reasons as well. First off, you wanted to maintain contact with loyalists. The loyalists were supplying you with intelligence and you wanted to maintain uh, contact with them. You also wanted to prevent the Americans from using these rivers for their own communication and their, for their transportation. So if you had supplies for the American army and you wanted to move them around to say County, you wanted to move them around what is today Bergen County, the easiest way would have been to use the rivers and the, thanks to the uh, British gunboat, um, you would not have been able to do that. The British uh, gunboats also welcomed deserters uh, and generally made nuisances of themselves in the colony. So if you look back at the accounts of the American Revolution in this region, they are full of accounts of how the British used the Passaic and Hackensack rivers. Um, it is September 1777. This huge foraging expedition was not only to help feed the British troops, but it was also to create a diversion uh, because the British were also attacking Philadelphia at the time. Um, in September 30th, I know 3,000 British in boats came up the Hackensack River. They were very hungry. It was an immense raid into this region. And then Newark in 1780, uh, 100 loyalists came into Newark, raided the town. Uh, fortunately, the uh, militia was able to respond. They were able to recapture some of the livestock. But again, the uh, loyalists were able to use the river, reach Newark, and to plunder the town. Which now having thought having thought a little bit about the America, the first revolution, let's talk about the other revolution, and that is the Industrial Revolution. This is a Civil War era photograph of the Passaic River. You can see a swing bridge for the railroad that we have now, and you see a couple of and you see a schooner here on the Pacific River, no doubt unloading cargo. Now, even though we did have a railroad at this time, or even though we didn't have railroads at this time, bulk cargoes were, were increasingly important. We have one of the most important cargoes from an agricultural point of view was manure and night soil. So you are raising crops to feed New York City. New York City is sending back horse manure, cow manure, human waste, which is now being processed into fertilizer to grow more food to sell in the New York market. Lumber. Throughout the 1800s into the 1900s, this region was growing tremendously. We needed a lot of lumber for building. Stone and other building materials, again, the region was growing immensely. We needed building materials, so they came in at the landing. Hay, New York City, 
ran on horsepower, quite literally. So you had to send hay to the city. We were still, uh, this was still a very much an agricultural region. So we were still producing grain at this time, sending it to the market of New York City. And all kinds of miscellaneous materials uh, would have been brought up and down uh, of the river. Again, we no longer, this is no longer the only way to get around, but now it is a very good way to bring bulk cargoes in or out of northern New Jersey. So we have a, a series of newspaper advertisements from 1828 that shows a little bit about how this trade works with the schooner General Jackson, which was active on the Passaic River. We see that the schooner was bringing in coal in January, lumber in March, singles in August, and coal again in August. Trips up and down the East Coast, bringing in primarily the bulk cargoes and cargoes of, of building material. And here is a, again, turn of the century photograph of um, lumber being unloaded from a sailing vessel in Newark. I, this looks like a uh, last for plastering walls, again, being unloaded uh, on a, on a, uh, from a ship in Newark. And this photograph only recently uh, became available, showing a schooner on the Hackensack River. I'm just wondering if this schooner could have been the Kate Lawrence or the General Grant. Again, these are the schooners that served the Van Buskirk brick mill at the, at the northern head of navigation in what is today um, New Milford. But you can see the very large schooner. She's low in the water, has a lot of, has a very heavy cargo and sailing through the swing bridge on the railroad. Here's a photograph, a postcard of the Newark waterfront. You can see a steamboat for passenger travel. And then here you have at least three schooners being unloaded or loaded at one of the docks in Newark. This is again another photograph. Uh, I think this dates to about 1915. This is, a, I believe, a Canadian schooner bringing lumber in for unloading at Newark. Now, the last major cargo on the, that moved under sail on the Hackensack River were bricks. There were a number of brick yards in Little Ferry and uh, south of Hackensack along the river. We had some excellent clay beds. We produced a lot of bricks, and most of them were shipped to the New York market. There were about nine schooners engaged in the brick trade. And unfortunately, this is about the best surviving photograph of any of them uh, taken at Little Ferry. You can see the, the two massive schooners here being loaded with bricks for uh, building in New York City. Here is a little bit better photograph showing the drying shed at the brick yard. So after you molded the bricks, this is where they'd be put to dry before they were placed into the kiln. And another photograph of the uh, drying shed way, way off in the background. And what I love about this 1910 photograph is that you see so many different modes of transportation. We have the brickyard and the river traffic in the background. We have the trolley car on the bridge itself. We have the horse-drawn wagon, and I think we even have an automobile. And this would, of course, have been a movable bridge so that ships could get up and down the Hackensack River. This is my own sketch of the last large schooner on the Hackensack River, the Dustin Cressy. Now, during the 1920s, the Dustin Cressy came south from Canada with a load of lumber. The schooner was unloaded, but hidden under the lumber was a load of alcohol. This was, of course, during Prohibition. And the schooner was, after being unloaded in Harrison, 
was brought across the river to Newark where the liquor was unloaded. It was um, prohibition agents discovered the liquor, the schooner was impounded. And then a group of sometime around 1933, a group of um, people in Hackensack were going to bring the ship north to the Hackensack and convert her into a failed training vessel for an organization called the Junior Mariners. The, uh, was the, it was the depression, the, the, the project never got off the ground, the Dustin Cressy still anchored in Hackensack or moored in Hackensack, caught fire, burned to the waterline, and the charred remains are still visible uh, at what is today the Bergen Record Building, uh, just upstream of the U.S. Submarine Memorial at USS Ling. So if you've ever been up to a Ling at low tide, you can see the remains of this ship. Again, a ship that kind of bridges the era between the um, era of commercial sail and the era, that we say, of recreation or of um, more recreational sailing, more recreational navigation of these rivers. So that brings us to era three, the recreation and leisure upstream and all and hard work downstream. This is a new club in Newark around the turn of a, a 20th century. So all of those, all of that lumber we were bringing in, all of that stone we were bringing in, all those bricks we were manufacturing, the population was growing. The railroads were bringing commuters into what would become the suburbs that we know today, and people needed recreation. And there was the Passaic River, there was the Hackensack River. We could have a wonderful program here at the public library about someone perhaps to talk about when Mountain View was known as the Venice of America. If you wanted to take a vacation, you could go to Wayne Township and stay at Mountain View. But that's a little bit farther upstream than I really want to talk about today. This is the Newark Yacht Club on the Passaic River. Again, this is a very wonderful resource for all kinds of recreation now. And here is the Bogota Boat Club at Hackensack. This is the town city of Hackensack. You can see the commercial vessels loading or unloading here. But right across the river is a boat club. There are a number of yacht clubs, canoe clubs, boat clubs up and down the river at this time in history, around 1900, 19, uh, 1900, you know, maybe 1930, 1940. Here's a very well dressed group of people going for a boat ride on a Sunday afternoon somewhere up river. Uh, around Hackensack, uh, a, a camp on the Hackensack River just north of Hackensack. You can see the canoes, you can see the docks, you can see the, uh, the, the restaurant, a uh, place to go and place to recreate. And this is one of the canoe clubs uh, in Oradell. Now, I should mention that you did not join a canoe club or a boat club because you like to go, just because you like to go out on a canoe or a boat. These are also the social, these are also for social life. You don't join a golf club, just to, you don't join a country club just because you like to play golf. You join it for the social, you join it for the dancing, you join it for the carnival, you join it for the uh, social life and the camaraderie. And these canoe and yacht and boat clubs serve that purpose in the towns uh, along the upper part of the river, particularly the Hackensack River, which is really still very clean. But downstream around Newark, around Kearney, uh, was a very busy, a major commercial port. This is a map of the Federal Shipbuilding Company, which was a subsidiary of United States Steel that had established a shipyard in Kearney. And you can see the ship, uh, shipways, the launching ways, the sitting out basins. 
to produce a number of ships for both the First and the Second World War. Uh, this is a, a transport leaving Carney for on her sea trials in 1918, just after the end of the First World War. During the Second World War, the, uh, the Federal shipyards produced a great many Liberty ships and warships. Uh, this is a riveter or member of a riveting crew. He is heating up the rivet to be red hot, which they don't pass up to the uh, man working the rivet gun. Uh, the title of this photograph is called A Hot One for Hitler. And this is the USS Juno uh, being launched from federal shipyards. Another thing, though, that was necessary for the growth of New Jersey is drinking water. And this, again, 19, I think this photograph dates to 1908. This shows a steam powered dredge creating what is today the Oradell Reservoir. Now, the Hackensack River, the flow in the river is a lot less than it was historically, primarily because so much of the freshwater flow has been stopped uh, by the Oradell Reservoir. The river is a lot smaller, it's a lot silkier than it was historically. The other thing that was happening at this time, this is a 1920s era photograph. This shows the infancy of Fort Newark. Today, Fort Newark is one of the world's major seaports, but you can see that the Fort Newark started out as a single basin. I believe there were maybe 11 um, or so uh, berths that could accommodate seagoing ships. Fort Newark was never more than a minor seaport until the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey got involved. And with all that money that the Port Authority has, they were able to convert it into a seaport that serves even the largest ships, such as this roll on, roll off automobile transport ship. And you see her coming in to, I believe, uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey. The last area that I want to talk about is the one that I call benches that face the river. When we talk about the rehabilitation of the river in terms of pollution control, in terms of habitat restoration, in terms of creating parks, a phrase you often hear is that benches face the river. At one time, if you went to a riverfront park the, and sat in a park bench, the park bench would face away from the river because the river was just so dirty and smelled so bad. Now we want to work to clean up these rivers and we want benches that face the river in our parks. And this was a photograph I took when I was uh, on spring break, or I was all out of the office during spring break when things were quiet and you had these three young men in a canoe uh, just on upstream of, um, in, uh, right on the Passaic River just downstream of the city of the bay. One of the major problems with the uh, Hackensack and Passaic Rivers, mostly on the Passaic River, was the contaminated sediment, particularly the contamination with dioxin from the production of Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. The Passaic River sediments were some of the most badly contaminated of any river in the country. And this shows a scientist from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration taking sediment samples from the bottom of the river. The, there was a major dredging project in the lower Passaic River. Uh, that, uh, I'm not sure where the project is at the moment, but here you see a U.S. Army uh, a dredge under the direction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers pulling out the muck, the contaminated muck in Newark. You see the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, all fluttering around observing the process. The Passaic Valley 
War, uh, sewage Commission at one time operated what were called skimmer boats. Just a few years ago, these were boats that would go up and down the uh, Hackensack River and Newark Bay, scooping up floating trash and taking it off the river for proper disposal. We have a number of organizations that are working on habitat restoration. Here, the Friends of the Pacific River are working on uh, restoring the stream banks with native vegetation. And off in the background here, you see several eight-man rowing cells from one of the local rowing clubs or one of the local high schools that row on the river. I don't know if any of you have ever been on the Riverkeeper tour of the uh, Hackensack Meadowlands, but the Hackensack Riverkeeper operates the uh, pontoon boat and pontoon boat tours that will take you around and show you the wildlife and the natural environment of the Meadowlands. They're they're well worth a uh, they're well worth a trip if you ever have the opportunity to take one of those tours. We have, of course, a number of museums along the rivers. We have the, the most famous one is New Bridge Landing or the Steuben House, uh, which is operated, which is owned by the state of New Jersey. It's a New Jersey State Park, but is managed essentially by the Bergen County Historical Society. Just across the river from the Steuben House in the 1920s and into the 1930s, there was a Native American village uh, it was designed, or the museum that was designed to teach people about Native Americans. Um, there were several, uh, there were several powwows, Native dancers, uh, wigwams. As you can see, the Native people here in this photograph are wearing regalia from a number of different tribes, a number of different groups. It really wasn't the most, um, shall we say, academically rigorous uh, museum uh, interpretation, but it was a real, um, very serious, very real attempt to acquaint people living in this region with Native American culture, Native American history. Some of you may then have been aboard the USS Wing, the submarine memorial which was a World War II era submarine and the last of the fast uh, submarines that uh, was brought to New Jersey in the early 1970s, became a memorial, open for tours. Right now, the, um, the future of this vessel is very much in doubt because the Bergen record had sold the building behind it. And the new property owners do not want a museum in the river, right in front of their uh, property. It's going to be developed into luxury condos. Uh, funding for the wing is languishing, and the river has tilted up so badly that this vessel cannot be towed back out of the river. So keep your eye on what's happening with the USS Wing. It's, um, it's bound to be very interesting as things go on. We, of course, have the uh, State Park, the Meadowlands Environmental Center on the Hackensack River. It's well worth the trip. There are walking trails. There is a nature center, a museum. There are public programs there. Across the river, the site of what used to be the um, county um, hospital and um, asylum. Is Snake Hill. This was the inspiration for the Prudential Insurance Company, um, but they took the Rock of Gibraltar instead of State Hill, State Snake Hill, excuse me, as a corporate logo. About half of this hill is gone because uh, it was a stone quarry and then the Turnpike uh, Eastern Extension, but the hill is still there. It has been, what's left of it has been preserved. And of course, the, the land around it and the land along the river has become a park. There are a number of rowing clubs and high schools that are rowing competitively on the Passaic River. It's becoming increasingly popular. 
and there are, we're bringing more and more people out onto the river to reacquaint them with what a uh, wonderful resource this is. This is a canoe trip that was that was being organized for a school group by the Hackensack River Keeper. And if you want to learn more, obviously I will uh, point out that a great convenience my book on this subject is available uh, on the stack of the Wayne Public Library. And it's also available from American History Press or uh, via Amazon. And uh, we have a little bit of time, so maybe it would be a, a good time to uh, take some questions. Well, I'll, I'll start with uh, Jeff, the opera addict question. Uh, how did the Native Americans use the river? Uh, we have found a few canoes. Most the Native Americans in this region use dugout canoes. Uh, so they certainly would have gotten around using dugout canoes. But one of the more important things, particularly in the non-tidal section, is they constructed a number of fish weirs on the river. There was a large fish weir uh, in what is today stretching over the Passaic River between Garfield and Passaic. There was another fish weir farther upstream. I have not personally, I'm not personally aware of any fish weirs on the Hackensack River. Uh, but the short answer to that question is that the biggest most important resource they took from the river were, were fish, and there were a number of very large, very impressive uh, fish weirs that uh, they used for, for harvesting fish. We're not too sure about shellfish and clams. Certainly, they would have, um, that, that was a resource that would have been available. Certainly, hunting uh, in the meadowlands and the swamp, in the, uh, swamp areas or the Wetlands, wetlands uh, would have been another thing, but uh, the, what survives today are uh, are the fish weirs. We still see traces of them in a lot of the. I river. have a question: Are people eating the fish from these rivers today? Unfortunately, not. Um, when the when a when a blue crab was tested for the presence of dioxin by an environmental chemist to see if it was safe to eat. It was so full of dioxin that the readings literally overloaded his instrumentation. <laughs> they were higher than his instrumentation was designed to measure. Wow. Uh, 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 I don't know if you met Steve Marshall, another historian. He is a uh, he went to the New Jersey New Newark College of Engineering. And uh, it was in the 1970s, and there was only about one or two laboratories in the entire country that could do a, a, a water analysis the way we, we used to do them today. So a professor just started work at the College of Engineering, looked at the Passaic River and says, huh, I wonder what's in this river. But the, takes a sample of water, sends it to his buddy at the University of Arizona, again, one of the only places in the country where they could do a water quality analysis. A few weeks later, he gets, gets a letter back. Ha, ha, ha. Very funny. Now that you have gone through the chemical stock room and sent me a sample of every poison you could find, please send me a real sample of the water. So uh, we are we are very much discouraging people from eating anything they catch in at least the lower parts of the Passaic and Hackensack River. Is, is there any way to remove dioxin from the water? Oh boy. Um, not really. Uh, the best way to get rid of it is to dredge. Dredging is expensive. Um, you've got to land, you've got to dispose of the dredge spoils, the dredge materials. Most of that means landfilling. Uh, the other option you have is to cap the, um, is, is to cap the contaminated sediments so that they don't migrate up. So the, 
there are there is some evidence that there are bacteria that will destroy dioxins and other a similar pollutants over time, but of course that's going to be a very long process. So what the EPA, the strategy that the EPA has adopted for the Passaic River is where the contamination is really bad, we'll dredge. Where the contamination we can live with, we'll cap. We'll be, it'll be a long time before people are able to eat uh, the fish or the crabs from this part of the river because these things do eventually migrate out of the sediment and do enter the food chain. So even though we have it under control, even though it's capped, it's still going to be a risk. So I have a feeling our grandchildren are going to be, when our, uh, when our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren are doing the same presentation, sometime in the future we'll probably still be talking about the dioxin and the PCB at the bottom of the Pacific River. Uh, couple other, yeah, is the place Conquanot now Clifton? Yes, someone had the, the good sense to change the name with the town to Clifton right around the time of the First World War. Also, the area that is, was the landing was kind of broken up. Place uh, Conquanot was the name of the landing, it was the name of the region, it was the name of the little miniature seaport. So you, when you talk about it, you're talking about parts of the state, you're talking about parts of Wallington, you're talking about parts of Clifton, but for the most part, uh, when we think about that township, we talk about that region, we think of today as Clifton. I see another question that came in on the chat is the water diversion tunnel. Um, I was personally involved with that briefly not as a not as an environmental scientist or chemist, but because I was a member of the Highlands Historical Society, and our historical society got the comment on the tunnel proposal. Um, I really don't know what is the current status of that. Uh, most of the efforts in the in recent years has been on environmental remediation, more so than flood control, uh, controlling stormwater runoff. There was a marvelous series of uh, articles in the Bergen record about flooding and the current methods to control it. The tunnel project, the, the flood tunnel, the version tunnel, I don't think it's, it's going to die anytime soon, but I think that more people are putting more effort into flood zone buyouts and trying to control stormwater runoff than they are in trying this, this massive uh, 20 mile tunnel. But again, it's one thing that we're going to keep our eyes, keep our eyes on. No, I have no idea what's going to happen in the future with that. How did local flooding problems affect the Revolutionary War? I've never seen anything about flooding and the revolution. Um, my wife was a curator at the Guy Mansion Museum for many years, and she remembers seeing as far back as the 1760s um, farmers, instead of paying taxes in cash, could pay their taxes in kind by working on flood control pro projects. Um, but no, I never heard of, of any kind of a flood affecting the, um, the outcome of a battle or a skirmish or having any influence on, on the course of the war, but um, it, it certainly was a problem even then. Are we going to be able to clean the Hackensack River, if not the Passaic yes, River? I was, I was very fortunate that uh, the university was sent a copy of the cleanup plan and asked to comment on it. And I was uh, I was on the committee that um, that is that it was part of our official response. Um, what we found was that the access the levels of contamination do in fact prevent present uh, danger to wildlife and ultimately they could get farther up the food chain. So it does represent, it is a good idea. Uh, we found nothing in the plan that would, would, would tell us that it wasn't a good idea. So what's gonna happen now? I don't know. We, of course, we've got the infrastructure bill. We've got the gateway uh, rebuilding the portal bridge. Uh, I have no idea which, which, where the EPA is gonna be spending its money, but the Hackensack River is certainly 
on their things to do list. You know, where it is, I could in fact. Uh, just one more question. Uh, the money for the cleanup would come through the Superfund program. And the way the Superfund works is the federal government will take the EPA's money and they'll go in and start the cleanup. And then they will start to sue individual polluters to recover the cleanup cost. So uh, depending on who polluted the Hackenback River, they'll, that's who they'll be looking for to recover the money from. So it's a long and fascinating uh, process. And uh, the short answer is yes, the cleanup starts with federal money. And that's uh, about all I have to say today. I want to thank you all for coming out, uh, giving me, uh, sharing your lunch hour with me. This is this is a nice opportunity for me, and and this is uh, very enjoyable. Yeah.